Timberlake Church, thanks again for joining us today. My name's Mariah, and we're so glad that you made it to service. We've got a great day planned. If this is your first time with us, we would love to have you head over to our website or download the Timberlake app and fill out a connection card. We would love to know that you're joining us. If you're watching from a computer today, we wanna to hear from you in the comments below. We're doing church just a little bit differently, so let us know where you're watching from or if something stands out during the message. Thanks again for joining us, and welcome to Timberlake Church.
Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for Timberlake Online. I really hope you've been enjoying online church as much as I have, but I have to be honest with you, I'm really missing the donuts and seeing all of you, of course. You know, we've been brainstorming ideas of ways that we can all stay connected during these times. And I think one way is through shared experiences like this. When we're all doing the same thing together, even if we can't physically be together. 
You know, around this time in service on a normal Sunday, I'd be saying, turn to somebody and give them a high five as you're seated, but we can't really do that, right? So instead, why don't you pull out your phone and snap a pic of how you're doing church today. Make sure you tag us in it so we can all see your view of service today. And I think another one of these things that, that we can all do together and make a really big impact when we do is through our giving. Check out this quick video of all the ways that you can get involved in this with your church family. There are so many ways that you can give digitally here at Timberlake Church. First, you can visit us at timberlakechurch.com give. Click give now and you'll be taken to a simple and secure form where you can choose to make a one-time donation or set up recurring giving. Next, select your Castle Rock campus and then click next and follow the instructions to create an account. Another convenient way to give is by using the Timberlake Church app. Select your Castle Rock campus and then select give. You will be taken to where you can select your type of gift and create an account. And last but not least, you can simply mail a check to our central church office. If you would like for us to send you a pre-stamped offering envelope, send us an email at castlerockinfo at timberlake.church. Well, thank you so much for your generosity and your faithfulness in this season. You really are making a huge difference. Come on, let's pray. God, we thank you for another opportunity to sow into your kingdom. God, to reach people here in our community and around the world with your love. Now, we love you and we thank you for all that you are doing in us and through your church. We pray all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, hey, church, welcome again to Timberlake. I'm so glad that you're here. My name is Ryan. If this is your first time with us, thanks for joining us. We're so glad that you found us, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube. We consider it such a privilege every time you take just a piece of your week, of your day, and, and hang out with us. We're obviously doing church just a little bit differently. We normally meet in a building, but, uh, but right now we are the church uh, online from our homes in quarantine. I hope that you're doing well. Uh, I hope that you have found things to keep you uh, sane in this weird time. I think it's been, what, four months of quarantine or four weeks, I guess. I don't know. I don't, it's all blur, right? Uh, but I hope that you're doing well. I hope you had a great Easter. Um, I know that we had a really good Easter. It was kind of a weird one. We realized this week that we have never in the history of our marriage, of our family, have we ever had Easter alone. Um, it was our first one as, a, as just a family. No friends, no extended family. It was weird, but, but also kind of awesome. We had an egg hunt afterwards. Uh, thanks for sending in all your videos and photos of, of your virtual egg hunts. It was cool to see that and be a part of that with you. Uh, for us, it was, it was kind of strange because we, we missed out on this massive egg hunt that we normally have at church. And yet for our household, we have more candy uh, than we know what to do with. We were almost out of October candy and then uh, it just got completely blasted and replenished. And as a parent, I'm concerned, right? We don't need that much candy. As a man child, I'm pretty jazzed that the candy box has... Uh, has been filled back up. It's going to be an interesting and wonderful couple of weeks uh, of candy. The quarantine and the, and the loads of Easter candy don't go great hand in hand, but, uh, but I press on. So I want to talk to you for just a few minutes today about something that I feel like is foundational, literally and figuratively, I guess. The key passage that, that I want to lean into comes from Matthew chapter 16. And if you've been around for long enough or, or you've heard me speak on multiple occasions, you've probably heard me speak from Matthew chapter 16. It's, it's, it's one of my favorite verses or uh, passages in all of Scripture, one of my favorite stories in all of Scripture, where Jesus is speaking to, to Peter and he says, I will build my church. It's a small clip from, from a much larger passage, and, and I'll build context here in just a couple minutes. But as a church and, and as a society and really as humanity right now, we keep talking about adjustments. 
that we're adjusting to things, that we keep having to adjust to everything around us, right? Our, our kids are adjusting to being at home all the time, you know? Husbands and wives are adjusting to, to each other being home all the time, right? We're adjusting to everything. I, I, saw, I saw an internet meme the other day that, that uh, the caption read that this person's dog was not used to having people home all day long. And it kept just stopping and staring at them in the middle of various rooms. And then it was just numerous pictures of this dog just standing in the middle of a hallway, staring at the owner uh, because the dog was making adjustments to life, right? My dog, my, my tiny six pound dog, uh, keeps escaping multiple times a day. I'm fairly confident she's annoyed that we're there all day uh, and is attempting to leave us. Everybody is adjusting, right? Including our pets. I was driving by Safeway the other day and gas was $2.42. And I thought, this is the greatest day of my life. And then I looked down and realized I didn't need gas. In fact, I've not needed gas in three weeks. There's nowhere to go, right? We're adjusting to things. We're changing things. We keep talking about these adjustments that we're making, and, and really most of them are adjustments that we're making in an effort to cope with life. We're trying to cope with our current situation, our current reality, but I'm wondering if there's a bigger plan in mind, if there's a bigger picture and a bigger purpose to all of this. Paul wrote the early church and he told them that their kingdom work was not in vain, that nothing is wasted, that God doesn't waste anything. Maybe we're not in a season of adjustment, we're in a season of rebuilding, restructuring, if you will. Oscar Wilde wrote this. He said, the church is like an aging grandmother surrounded by memorabilia and odd musty smells. Sorry, Grandma. Lovely to visit, but intolerable to live with. And let me just put this disclaimer out there. This does not apply to my grandmas. I have the coolest, best-smelling grandmas that I would gladly live with. But you understand the sentiment, right? I don't know God's plan. We don't get to see God's plan. What we can see is the church is being forced into into some new habits. We're being forced into a different way of thinking, into a restructuring. We're changing the way that we think. And, And let me remind you that the church is not a building. The church is you and the church is me. We are the church. I'm in a building right now, but we are the church. We're changing the way that we think. We have to change the way that we do community. We have to to change the way that we we do generosity. We're we're creating new avenues of generosity. We have to change the way that we worship. I don't know if this season has been particularly difficult for you to participate in worship. It's kind of odd sitting in your living room, watching something on the TV, and actually participating in the worship service. But it's also kind of awesome. It's been a little difficult and unique for me, but man, I caught myself in tears last week with the worship. Not because of of the band or the singers or any of that, but because the power of God was being displayed and, and, and conveyed through a TV screen. And it hit me because I think that if we can change and restructure the way that we worship, we come out on top. Matthew chapter 16, Jesus uses his own self-designation, son of man. And and he comes to his disciples with this question. And maybe you've heard this question before. It says in verse 13, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. There's a lot going on in this passage of scripture and we'll kind of break it down, but I want to ask this question. Through this, what can we learn 
about the church, about the church, not the, not the building, but the church. Number one, Jesus is the ultimate leader. Jesus is the ultimate leader. Jesus asked this question. The disciples kind of beat around the bush. Well, maybe you're, you're Jeremiah. They say, you're Jeremiah. You're one of the prophets. And then he says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter steps up. Peter answers the question, and he elevates the leader. He says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Tell me a higher power, right? Tell me a higher power. Peter's immediate response was to solidify the depth of Jesus' authority. The primary purpose for the church is to understand who Jesus is. Everything else that we do, the community, the generosity, the outreach, it falls underneath and in line with us knowing and becoming more like Jesus, more and more and more every single day. Here's the second thing. We learn that the church is important. It seems obvious in this setting, right? Like, like of course the preacher's gonna push church. Of course the preacher's gonna say that church is important. Well, let me take it a step further. Look at what Paul writes in Ephesians. He says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. We're coming off the heels of Easter where, where Christ went to the cross to give up everything. For what? For the church. For the church that he loved. The reality is that in our culture in 2020, and and this transcends our current reality, this transcends our our current situation, there are a ton of church substitutes. There are things that we can swap out for the church, for being the church. Let me go back to the fact that the church is not a building. Don't get me wrong, I, I can't wait to get back to the building. I can't wait till our hallways are full and our kids' classrooms are full. I can't wait until there's, there's handshaking and high fives and I can't wait to hug your neck. I can't, I can't wait to stand in front of you and I'm assuming that you laugh hysterically at your house at my, at my jokes via the internet, but I can't wait till you're sitting in the room and we're actually uh, interacting together and engaging together. I can't wait to stand next to you and, and corporately worship together. I can't wait until the church comes to a building but I think that we're in a rebuild. And I think that the rebuild is showing us the importance of the capital C church. And I think that this season is potentially showing us the rut that we've been in. I think it's identifying some things. We're being shaken up, right? In this season, we're being shaken up. And when this is over, I want to be a better church. I want to to be better church, right? Here's the third thing. We learn that objective truth is essential. Objective truth is essential. That's a word that maybe we've not heard a lot lately, right? Essential things are everywhere. We're being talked about what's essential. You know, at every turn, every single day, we're hearing about how essential things are key to our lifestyle right now. Last week, I bought bought an air fryer. And it was in that moment that I finally understood what the word essential meant. (laughs) If you don't have an air fryer, they're truly essential to your life. Uh, So essential that I went back and bought a bigger one because I felt like we needed to air fry more things. (laughs) Uh, It's truly essential to my life. I've been relatively busy during this this lockdown, during this quarantine, uh, but I still feel the need to air fry everything. And I've not gotten to everything. This past week, we stopped and we air fried Oreos. The coolest thing about the air fryer is how healthy it is. Uh, You can air fry anything, and you're essentially dieting, um, no matter what it is. So I encourage you to get an air fryer. That's my plug for air fryers. Um, Hopefully they send me money for promoting them. But we're being told what is essential right now, right? We're, we're, We're identifying the things in our life that are essential. Grocery stores are essential. Hospitals are essential. Apparently Home Depot is essential, when Peter makes this, this confession, this, this description, this identification of what Jesus is, he's identifying how essential it is to Christianity, to what we are doing. Jesus comes in afterwards and solidifies it. Objective truth, this essential objective truth is truth that comes without bias. 
The church should be teaching objective truth because of how essential it truly is. This idea that comes without bias. Without it, we open ourselves up to a world of deception. When Peter makes this confession of faith, Jesus comes in and he says, on this rock, I'll build my church. He says, Peter, on this rock, this proclamation that you're making about who I am, about where I came from, about the power and the authority that I have on this proclamation, Peter, I'm going to build my church. As we move forward as a church, as we, as we rebuild and we restructure and, and we learn some new ways of doing church, I think it's crucial that we understand, we remember that it is on this rock, that Jesus is the Messiah. That is our foundation, that it is the most important piece of this puzzle that we're a part of. Everything else falls in line behind it. Here's the fourth thing. I think that we learn it takes a team. It takes a team of people, right? The church is a team. Being the church, especially right now, it takes all of us. I think that so often we have this mentality that someone else is going to church. Not going to church, but they're going to church. Someone else will do it for us. The reality is that it takes all of us. It takes each one of us to be the church. If you look at what happens right after Jesus confirms who he is, right after he speaks to the nature of his movement that he's leading. He turns to his followers and he says in verse 19, he says, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. He's not referring to some magic key that opens up this secret door in the back of the closet. He's referring to this confession that Peter makes, this proclamation, this description. That is their access point. What is the key? The key is that Jesus is the Messiah. He is in fact the son of God. That's their access point. I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. It's this understanding that Jesus came for us to do what we could not do for ourselves. Once we understand that, we all hold the same key. And this truly does become a, a all in this together type situation because we all now hold the same key. Once we're all participants in this in this free grace that God gives us, our job then is to output it, for us to come together as a team and output it. The question that we have to ask is, is where are we gonna take our place? Who are we on the team? Doing something significant for God as a response to what God has done for us. And again, the minute we become participants in this free grace, God qualifies us to output. Peter says, you are the Messiah. You are the son of God. Here is my recognition. Here is my acceptance of who you are. And Jesus says, here are the keys to the kingdom. You're in, man. He says, welcome to the team. He wasn't hazed. He wasn't, he wasn't uh, forced to go through this series of, of rigorous tests and, and qualifiers. Jesus says, welcome to the team. And we see it over and over again in scripture. He goes to Zacchaeus and Zacchaeus says, you're the son of God. Here's my recognition. Here's my acceptance. And Jesus says, welcome to the team. He goes to Nicodemus. Nicodemus was this religious leader. Nicodemus is struggling with the concept of being born again. How can you be born twice? He doesn't understand this New Testament church that Jesus is pushing. So Jesus goes back to the Old Testament and he pulls out this example from the book of Numbers and he teaches Nicodemus. And then in verse uh, 16 of chapter three, he says, he says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son who shall ever believe in him would have everlasting life. Welcome to the team. Welcome to the team. He said, welcome to the team. See, I think that God has this huge job for the church, bigger than we know, bigger than we recognize, bigger than we've ever seen before. And I think that he's using this period of life where we sit in uncertainty and confusion and boredom, right? I think he's using the season to build something incredible in a new way. Again, I don't know that God created this. I don't think that God created this, but I also don't think that God wastes anything. God has given us in this season, a, a bigger reach as the church. 
You know, millions of people, literally millions of people are tuning in online every single week to churches all around the world. No reach has ever been bigger or broader than it is right now in all of history. The game is changing. The message is staying the same, but the method is changing. See, I think that we are forced to make the same decision that disciples are making back in the early church. I think that we're faced with the same decisions that they have. Do we get on board with this, this building process? Do we stand behind Jesus in this building process? I think that they were given this invitation. I think that we are given this invitation. I have three quick thoughts and then we'll close. I think number one, we're invited to make a decision to, be, to belong. That Christ invites us to belong to something. And remember, I said it, this is a, this is a team sport. This is a team game. Christianity takes a team. It's why Jesus was so, so forthcoming in his desire for us to be on the team. It's why he made it so incredibly easy to be on the team, that, that there are no qualifications to be a part of the team except sincerity and desire and, and a will to be a part of it. We live in a world that pushes individualism. We live in a world that says, man, you can do this on your own. You're strong enough to do this on your own. And then the world locks us into our homes and we're starting to realize, man, I miss people. I miss belonging to something. My hope in this season is that you start to change the way you do life so that when we're out of this season, we come running to a place where we belong, right? That we come running to, to a belonging to each other. That's what I think that God wants from us in this season. I was kind of knocked off my feet this past week. I read 1 Corinthians in chapter 1, in verse 10, it says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there is no divisions among you, but, you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. When we stand on Peter's proclamation that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Son of God, and everything falls behind that proclamation, we start to to remove division. We start to remove a lack of unity. And yeah, we have different opinions, we have different thoughts, we have different characteristics and personalities, but everything comes down to what's in here. And do we all stand and believe and trust in what's here? And when we all set our mind on what's in scripture and what Jesus pushed, what the word of God says, all of a sudden we become perfectly united. I love that Paul says we are perfectly united united. It doesn't matter if we're locked in our homes. It doesn't matter if we're sitting in a church aisle. God being in control and us submitting to that control unifies us. We belong. We are a part of a team. Here's the second thing. We're invited to invest our life in what matters. At Timberlake, we, we, we push this idea, one of our one of our culture values is, is, is that we strive to make more and better disciples of Christ. That's our goal. That is our, our, our main goal is to make more and better disciples for Christ. That's what matters most. He needs us to invest our lives not only in living a life for him, but, but sharing that life with somebody else sharing what Jesus did for you and for me with somebody else. The greatest charge that he ever gave in Matthew 28 was, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Therefore, go make disciples of all the nations. Here's number three, and I'll, I'll, I'll begin to close with this. We're invited to take a next step. And I don't know what your next step is. All I know is that there is a next step, right? There's a next step to all of this. First, our second Peter, he writes this. He says, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter addresses growth in two ways. He addresses growth when he says, grow in grace and grow in knowledge, I read the definition of grace the other day and I thought it was incredibly unique. I, I don't know, maybe I've never, I've never read the dictionary definition of grace. Typically when I try and read about grace, I go to the Bible. 
Uh, this week I went to the dictionary. It said that grace is courteous goodwill. And I thought, what a unique way of putting that. Courteous goodwill. Peter encourages us to grow in grace and knowledge. Grow in the fact that we are promoting goodwill in a courteous way. Grace that Jesus freely gave us. And knowledge that, that he is who he says he is. That he was who he says he was. That he's going to be who he says that he's going to be. Come on, I want to be a church that is a part of that. I want to be a church that's a part of that build. I want you to be a church that's part of that build. The, the build that says, man, I want to understand everything that God has for me. I want to understand every ounce of grace that God has given me. Mercy that God has given me. Trust and hope. Salvation. Strength. Understanding. Courage. I want to be a part of that build. Here's my encouragement to you. We're in a weird season of life right now, right? It just is what it is. Eventually, we'll stop talking about it. Eventually, we'll get back to life, but I think that life is gonna be different. So my encouragement to you in this is get a part or be a part of this, this, this rebuild. How do we rebuild? How do we restructure? How do we become a different church? How do we church differently? How do we church like God is leading us to church? As we watch things change, we're being forced to change. Are we changing with them? Are we changing our method while keeping the message exactly the same, that Jesus is who he says he is, that he was who he says he was? He's gonna be who he says he is gonna be. Come on, let's be a part of that church, right? Let me pray with you. God, thank you so much. God, thank you so much for who you are, for what you do. God, we trust in you. We trust in the fact that, that 2,000 years ago, you said, Peter, on this rock, I'm gonna build my church. What's the rock? The, church, the rock is the, the, the proclamation that Peter made. God, that you are the Messiah. Jesus is, in fact, the Son of God, sent to a world to do what we cannot do for ourselves. God, today we stand firm on that foundation. God, as we begin to, to restructure and we look differently about how we reach the world around us, how we speak into the world around us, God, I pray that you would help us to continually remember that it is you that founded this and we stand on you. But God, while our feet are stable and we're standing on this, God, I pray that you would give us new ideas and new opportunities, that you would open up new doors for us to be the church. God, to rebuild in, in something that is remarkable and powerful. God, we're excited to see what the church looks like as we progress and we move forward. God, us as the church, the capital C, the, the personified church. God, I cannot wait to see what it looks like. Help us to be that. Help us to change and evolve. God, we love you so much. We end every service with a simple ask. And the ask is this. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, let today be that day. I said it earlier. Jesus implored it. Jesus pulls us in. He draws us in. But, but we have to make the first step. We have to reach out and say, Jesus, yeah, I want a relationship with you. You made it incredibly easy to, you can do it on your couch, you can do it in your living room, you can do it in your bed, wherever you're sitting right now. You made it so easy that all we have to do is, is say yes. It doesn't require a qualifier, it requires sincerity and a will. Just there, wherever you're at, whoever you're with, I don't know what your relationship with Jesus looks like, but maybe today you need to say yes to something bigger than yourself. Maybe you need to say yes to that relationship. All you do is pray this prayer. You say, Jesus, thank you for salvation. You say, God, thank you for coming to this world to become fully man and die on a cross for me, for my sins, to give me salvation. You say, God, come into my heart and help me to live a life for you. God, give me my purpose and help me to live it out. And then just begin to say thank you because something amazing is happening in your life. God, thank you for salvation. Thanks for the things that you're doing. God, thank you for loving us, for caring about us, for being mindful of us. 
God, I pray that as we um, continue this process that you would help us to look for those avenues, look for those opportunities that we have to, to push and spread you. God, we want to be the output for your word. Help us to stand strong in the fact that you are the Messiah, that you are the Son of God. Lord, we love you so much. We ask in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, hey, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for hanging out with us. Uh, listen, be encouraged this week. Uh, I, I truly believe you're doing great through this. This is such a weird time. It's a difficult time, but you're doing great. I believe it. Hang in there. Keep doing it. Be the church this week. Find somebody to be the church with. Find a way to restructure and rebuild and build on top of uh, the Christian life that you already have had, or maybe you're, you're just now starting. Figure out what that next step is and do it this week. Find somebody and encourage them. Do it through text, do it through email or phone call or whatever that looks like. But listen, I'm excited to get you back in the building. I'm excited to see you again. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. Stay tuned for a couple things coming up and, um, and we'll see you hopefully very, very, very soon. All right, love you. Be encouraged. Bye, church. <laughs>